viruses, what are they? This is the story of how viruses were discovered, what we know about them, and how we classify them. The story begins with a disease that infects tobacco crops. In the 1800s, tobacco was a major cash crop in the Americas with the popularity of pipe smoking, chewing tobacco, and snuff. However, the tobacco plant was susceptible to a disease that stunted the plant's growth and created mosaic patches of yellowish brown on the leaves and caused the leaves to curl. The disease is called tobacco mosaic disease and can easily spread from plant to plant via human handling, contaminated tools or equipment, or simply by rubbing leaves of an infected plant. The disease was first described in South America and the North American colonies, and was later found in the Netherlands and in Europe as well. While tobacco plants didn't die from the disease, the tobacco that, produced, that was produced from these infected plants had a bitter taste and thus greatly reduced their market value. Today we know that the disease infects tomato plants, peppers, and cucumber plants as well. But in the 1800s, botanists sought to identify the cause of this disease that was responsible for destroying valuable tobacco crops. In 1892, the Russian botanist Dmitry Ivanovsky suspected that the tobacco mosaic disease was caused by a bacteria. So to prove his theory, he used a common device called a Chamberlain filter candle. This device consists of a hollow porous, unglazed porcelain tube that is placed inside a metal cylinder. And this device has a fluid inlet on the top and an outlet at the bottom. Here's an inside view. Ivanovsky proposed that if the tobacco mosaic disease causing agent was a bacteria, then the filtered liquid, aka the filtrate, will not infect healthy plants. So Ivanovsky injected sap from the crushed infected tobacco leaves into the metal chamber. The pressure forced the sap through the porous porcelain and out through the outlet, leaving the bacteria behind since the pores are too small for the bacteria to pass through. That is, of course, if the agent is bacterial. If the disease is caused by a bacteria, as he hypothesized, the filtered sap collected through the outlet will not be able to transmit disease to uninfected tobacco plants. So to test his theory, Ivanovsky transferred his filtered sap onto healthy plants and found that the filtrate did in fact spread the disease to healthy, non-infected plants. This proved that the tobacco mosaic disease was not caused by a bacteria, but by something else that is much smaller. Unaware of Ivanovsky's work, Martinus Berjernink, a Dutch botanist, performed similar experiments with similar results. But Berjernink went one step further than Ivanovsky did by calling the disease-causing agents a filtrable virus. The actual identification of the tobacco mosaic disease-causing agents had to actually wait for the invention of the electron microscope by Ernest Ruska and colleagues in 1931. And even with the invention, it took eight years for Ruska to publish the first images of tobacco mosaic disease causing agent, revealing, revealing it to be a long, thin, hollow cylinder like virus that measured 18 nanometers wide by 300 nanometers long. Since then, the electron microscope has gone through many technological improvements and played a major role in the discovery of over 5,000 different virus particles. Electron micrograph images of viruses such as this offered visual proof of their association with various infectious agents and defined them morphologically. As these early experiments suggested, viruses are indeed much smaller than bacteria, ranging from 20 nanometers to 900 nanometers. The Ebola virus is one of the larger viruses, measures 80 nanometers wide by 900 nanometers length, whereas the rhinovirus that causes the common cold and the pox virus causing smallpox are on the smaller end of the scale, coming around 30 nanometers in diameter, all well below the resolution of a compound light microscope. Just as a point of reference, bacteria are measured in the micrometer scale. And as you know, one micrometer is equal to that of a thousand nanometers. The electron micrograph images of the 5,000 or so known viruses 
identified viruses with different shapes. And the following terms are going to be important for you when you learn or talk about, vi about viruses. All viruses are made up of two basic components, their genome and a capsid. The genome is either a DNA or RNA molecule, but never both. The genome can either be single or double-stranded. They could be linear or circular in nature. And lastly, they could be a single large nucleic, uh, nucleic acid strand, or they could be multiple smaller strands called segments. Every viral genome is surrounded and protected by their protein, their protein coat called a capsid. And these capsids are composed of multiple copies of one or more protein subunits called capsomeres. Sometimes these capsids contain spikes made of glycoproteins. These are proteins that are covalently bonded to carbohydrates. Together, the genome and the capsid are collectively called the nucleocapsid. At the very least, every virus has a nucleocapsid. These nucleocapsids come in different shapes though, and thus helps us classify the viruses. The first shape are the icosahedral shaped nucleocapsids. Now an icosahedron has 20 faces with 12 corners, and when it's folded in a three-dimensional form, it can easily house and protect the genome, whether it's DNA or RNA. The adenovirus and the polioviruses are examples of viruses that have icosahedral nucleocapsids. A second shape are the helical nucleocapsids. The tobacco mosaic virus is an example of a virus with a helical nucleocapsid. Its RNA genome is first coiled in a helical fashion, and then multiple capsomeres are attached to its outer edge surrounding the genome, forming a long, thin spiral cylinder that has a hollow center. The third shape are the conical nucleocapsids. These have a genome tucked inside, similar to that of the icosahedral nucleocapsids. And lastly, are the group of viruses whose nucleocapsids don't fit any of these three categories. They are called the complex nucleocapsids. For example, the pox virus is a complex virus or a virus with a complex nucleocapsid. Its nucleocapsid is oddly shaped and surrounded by three member membranes with a core wall. Also, the bacteriophage, viruses that infect bacteria, are another example of viruses with complex nucleocapsids because they consist of an icosahedron shaped head that is placed on top of a long cylindrical sheath that has tail fibers. Now besides this core nucleocapsid, some viruses are surrounded with an external phospholipid membrane that's studded with proteins. These viruses are said to be enveloped viruses as opposed to those that do not have an envelope which are called unenveloped or naked viruses. The phospholipid membranes come from the host cell that made the virus. It could come from the host cell membrane, nuclear envelope, or their endoplasmic reticulum membranes. But in either case, the membrane is made from the host. The studded proteins are encoded by genes found in the virus's genome and are thus virus de derived. So because of this, we say that the envelope is actually made by a collaborative effort of the host and the virus. Now this drawing resembles the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. This virus has two identical single-stranded RNA molecules for its genome, and it's surrounded by a conical-shaped capsid. This capsid in turn is surrounded by an envelope with protruding spike-like viral proteins embedded in the envelope. Other enveloped viruses are shown here, the Ebola virus, rabies virus, herpes virus, and the influenza virus. And as previously shown, the tobacco mosaic virus, adenovirus, and poliovirus are unenveloped and thus are also called naked viruses. So, so far throughout this video, I've been very careful not to call a virus a cell because they lack major cellular components that every cell needs to grow and replicate, whether they are eukaryotic cells or prokaryotic cells. 
So for example, every cell has a double-stranded chromosomal DNA. This is not true for viruses. Some viruses have an RNA genome and thus do not have any DNA in them whatsoever. All cells have RNA molecules in the form of messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. Again, not true for viruses. Even though they have an RNA genome, they do not have the following messenger, ribosomal, or transfer RNAs. All cells have a liquid uh, jelly-like substance called the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is where metabolism occurs. It allows the cell to grow and reproduce on its own. Viruses do not have a cytoplasm and also do not grow or metabolize. They rely on the host cell to make more copies of themselves. Viruses don't have ribosomes, nor do they have a cell membrane, unless they stole the phospholipid membrane from the host cell to make their envelope. Because of this, viruses are called particles and not cells. So this brings to the question, what are viruses? I'll describe them as obligate intracellular acellular parasites. Intracellular because they need to enter a host cell that in turn makes more copies of the, of the virus particles. Acellular because they're not true cells. They don't have the common cellular components mentioned before, and thus they lack the basic cell functions. They're parasitic because the host cell ultimately dies. The host cell does not benefit from uh, being invaded by viruses. And lastly, obligate because the virus always needs to enter the host cell in order for more copies to be made. They are always acellular in nature and they are also parasitic. So where do viruses actually come from? The short answer to this question is that we really don't know. But scientists have developed three hypotheses to help answer these question, this question. The first hypothesis is called the virus first hypothesis. It states that viruses existed way before cells did as, and were self-replicating units. They didn't require a host. And that they evolved alongside with these host cells. Now, in other words, viruses were once able to replicate on their own without the help of a host cell. They evolved in close, close proximity with the cells and slowly lost the basic abilities to replicate on their own and became dependent on these hosts. The second hypothesis is known as the progressive hypothesis in which the DNA and RNA escaped from prior cells. So they originated from cells. These mobile DNA and RNA molecules then gain their abilities to move between cells. So what this hypothesis says is that organisms evolved, and as their organisms evolved, some of their DNA and RNA left the cells, possibly through cell death, and gained the ability to infect other cells and hijack them to make more copies of this DNA and RNA material before escaping and infecting other cells. The third and last hypothesis is called the regressive hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that the viruses were once complex, free living organisms that lost their genetic material, lost their ability to replicate independently, and then adapted to become parasitic in nature. This hypothesis proposes that viruses were once able to replicate on their own without a host cell. This differs from the virus first hypothesis because it is proposed that viruses were once something other than viruses. Over time, they lost their genetic material and with it, their abilities to replicate by themselves. These three hypotheses have some indirect evidence that support them, but to date, none of them have been proven. The next question that scientists have been asking is, how are viruses related to each other, as well as to living organisms? Scientists often try to group viruses together to make it easier to learn about them. The problem with viruses, though, is that there isn't much that they have in common. So, for example, in a phylogenetic tree known as the tree of life, all living organisms are placed along an evolutionary timeline based on the relatedness of their ribosomal RNA sequences. That's also backed up with independent biological data. But the problem is, is that viruses don't have ribosomes. They don't have a common biological activities, and nor do they have similar genes in their genomes. 
Thus, the tree of life as it's made will never include viruses. So how do we classify them? This is the problem that virologists have been facing for quite some time. The Baltimore classification system was developed by the Nobel, Nobel laureate David Baltimore in 1971. He classifies viruses into seven groups according to their genome type, DNA or RNA, and how these viruses replicate based on their messenger RNA synthesis and their need for reverse transcriptase during replication. The current classification scheme uses the following information. They mentioned Baltimore classification as just described, plus whether or not the virus has an envelope and their capsid morphology. A typical viral classification would look something like this, where viruses are first grouped together based on genome type, resulting into two major groups of DNA viruses and RNA viruses. Next, these groups are divided further based on whether the genome is double-stranded or single-stranded. This is then followed by whether the, the viruses use the enzyme reverse transcriptase or not. Now, the Roman numerals here refer to the Baltimore classi classification groups. David Baltimore put all the organisms, all the viruses that are currently known into seven major groups. These seven groups are then further divided into 14 smaller groups based on whether the viruses have an envelope or not. And lastly, these 14 groups are divided based on the shape of the nucleocapsid. The shapes are icosahedral, helical, and complex. In addition to the Baltimore classification or the current classification system, the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses, also known as the ICTV, groups viruses into a hierarchy of order, family, subfamily, genus, and species, and devise a formal naming scheme, such that all the orders end in Varalis, the family names end with Viridae, subfamily names end with Virinae, and the genus with virus. All the viral species are assigned to a genus. All the subfamilies and most of the genera are assigned to a family, and some families are then assigned to an order. Currently, there are many genera and families that are waiting to be assigned to a meaningful family or order, respectively. But further data will, will, is needed and will un undoubtedly classify them into either um, existing families and orders, or maybe we'll create new families and orders, respectively. So this ends my story on the basics of how viruses were discovered and what we know about them so far. So as I hope you can see that there are still many more questions that are yet left unanswered, which promises to be exciting for virologists as they continue to unlock the mysteries that are surrounding these tiny particles. Even though all viruses are pathogenic, they do offer us some important tools. For example, the retrovirus's reverse transcriptase. It's made it possible for scientists to clone human genes into bacterial genomes and produce important pharmaceutical grade drugs that help us today. I'll leave you with one thought though to ponder, and that is that viruses are often called microorganisms, small organisms. However, the word organism implies that viruses are living cells, and we know for a fact that that's not true. So, should viruses be called microorganisms? If not, what should we call them?